the thief hanging next to Jesus who asked him, remember me when you come in paradise today, you'll be with me, saw the difference in Jesus. The blind man who cried out, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me, saw his difference. Zacchaeus climbed into a tree to see Jesus because he saw difference. Everything in your life is determined by your ability to discern difference. Difference between truth and error. Right and wrong. Difference is often hidden so that it becomes the reward for passion. God hides his greatest gifts so evil men cannot desert them. God packages his greatness in common presentation like squaddling clothes at a manger so that only the discerner can locate the treasure. Difference is not easily discerned. Difference is not always obvious. Difference is not always valued. Nobody sees what you see, nobody. You say, what's the proof? Look who you married. Nobody else got her. I hate to say this, women, but obviously nobody else wanted your husband enough. But you saw difference. Mothers discern difference in their children. Difference in the cry. I've heard mothers say, I heard my baby. Nobody else heard that cry, but the mother did. Need magnifies difference. Many will never attend a Benny Hinn meeting until they're ill, and their need magnifies his difference. Many will never see difference in a message on prosperity until they lose their house. And they walk out one morning and their car has been taken because someone picked it up. Suddenly, the message on financial prosperity is magnified. Randy Morrison, pastor of Speak the Word Church in Minneapolis, Minnesota, is a longtime friend. I've spoken many times for his great church. He said, I never understood all of those sad songs you wrote until I went through some trauma. And suddenly, God's not through blessing you. Begin to make sense. Need magnifies difference. Loss magnifies difference. Training births the ability to discern difference. Your ability to discern difference decides who's comfortable with you, who pursues you. Your difference decides your salary. Your difference decides your promotion. Your difference schedules your exit from seasons. Your difference can be forgotten 
until a crisis emerged, like the butler forgot the difference of Joseph, till Pharaoh was going to do some killing if somebody didn't interpret his dream. I'm writing a book called The Twelve Differences in People. The difference in people is what they pursue. The difference in people is what they're willing to ignore. The difference in people is what they permit. The difference in people is who they believe. The difference in people is very critical. Every person has a different value. Every feeling has a different value. Every season has a different value. Your ability to discern difference, your ability to discern difference, the difference in a season, the difference in the divine deposit in an immediate moment. Difference is incredibly critical. It's critical to your success. It's critical to your joy. Most of us have become very disheartened when someone did not discern our difference. Some of us have felt the necessity to emphasize it. I'm different. We didn't trust their ability to discern it. The conduct and behavior of others reveals what they, reveal, what they discern about us. Every request reveals perception. If your child asks you for something, they have exposed and documented their perception of you. Discerning the difference and seeing the difference in people, the difference in questions that are asked. A huge difference between the jailer saying, what must I do to be saved? And the Pharisee question, why did you heal him on Saturday? Successful people develop a constant pursuit of seeing difference. Difference in a business transaction. Business opportunity, seeing the difference of that opportunity. It's critical in your life that you discern your difference and market your difference. Magnify it. The difference in the problem you are assigned to solve, capable of solving. Difference in the problem you're willing to be trained to solve. You must know yourself as well as you know God. You must know yourself as well as you know God. If you don't know you, you won't pursue God. Know your difference. The difference in what you can tolerate. The difference in what you will. Where you belong. The Holy Spirit is the master agent in the revelation of difference. He is the person who not only is in you, but he walks on your right side. And that seems confusing. How can he be in me and walk on my right side too? Well, you left some hair at the salon on the floor. And yet you have hair on your head. Does that require genius? No. Psalms 139 said, if I make my bed in hell, is there? If I ascend to the heavens, he's there. 
He is and everywhere God, but he manifests his presence through joy. And even though Psalms 139 says everywhere my presence is penetrated, yet there is a manifestation of his presence. And we know that there's a difference. We can go to McDonald's right now and he'll be there with us, but it doesn't feel there like it feels here. Because here is the elimination of all opposite forces and spirits. One of the roles of church is the elimination of contradictory influences. That's why you really can't serve God as well at home as you do in the house of the Lord. God's into saving time and money. And don't you imagine if you could serve God as well at home as you could here, he would save an awful lot of money on buildings. We would simply, we would simply be on TV, save electricity. I could reach a million people a week more if I did away with this building. Oh no, you could, oh yeah, I could sell this building. I could be on TV for years and years. So, so why? We sanctify a place where everything foreign to his presence is uncomfortable. We sanctify a house for his presence concentrated with the absence of everything foreign to him. Hallelujah. The purifying. Is that important? To have everything opposite God absence in an environment? H2O. Two parts hydrogen, one part oxygen, but if I add an extra part of oxygen, it is now hydrogen peroxide, which will kill you. When wrong things leave, right things happen. The purpose of coming into his house today and his presence today is to disconnect from every distraction, every satanic delusion that dilutes our focus on him. We've left everything. It's costly to come to church. Shoot, I could have slept three more hours. It's costly to come to church. It costs time, energy, a cleaning bill just for your clothes. Gas, wear and tear on the car. Not counting the adaptation when you get here. So we've got to perceive and discern there is a difference in this environment. Hell dreads it. Hell fears it. Because this is where the best you is born. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And all the barnacles of the world that have attached itself to your mental ship are cut off. Hallelujah. And you may have dragged in here, but you won't drag out. Because this is where there is an uncluttering of your life, an uncluttering of your mind. And to me, this is why the Holy Spirit the voice of the Godhead is so important. I want to talk to you about the greatest thing that ever happened to me. And that's my title today, the greatest thing that ever happened to me. If I had one year left to live, I'd want you to know the greatest thing that ever happened to me. I wish I could tell you it was when I fell in love, but it wasn't. I wish I could tell you it was when I stood and saw in Cairo, Egypt, the incredible pyramids. Whew. I like what Franklin Delano Roosevelt said when he saw the pyramids. He 
said, the need for man to be remembered is colossal. <laughs> I wish I could tell you when I, was, when I went to the Colosseum in Rome, where they used to feed the Christians to lions. I would like to tell you that the greatest thing that ever happened to me is when I walked through the catacombs in underground Rome where Christians hid to avoid being killed. But it wasn't. I could tell you I've been to Mount Kilimanjaro, the gorgeous, beautiful, unforgettable mountain. In the African mountains, the snow. There's a little town in Switzerland. No cars are allowed. I had to take a special way to get there. And every morning at 6 o'clock, I know because I've been there. There's a little town that's beautiful, precious, gorgeous. It's hidden. All the little vehicles are electric, like golf carts. And at 6 o'clock in the morning, you'll see children and wives and mamas trudging into the Catholic Church to pray at 6 and 6.30 in the morning. Beautiful, gorgeous, like a, something out of a magazine. Honolulu is beautiful, gorgeous, beautiful. When you get off the plane, they put flowers, but that's not the greatest thing that's ever happened to me. I've had some incredible things happen in my life, but the greatest thing that ever happened to me happened on my sister Flo's birthday, July the 13th, 1994. I'd gone to bed and thought I'll sleep in because I'd gone to bed at, if I recall, it was four o'clock or so in the morning. And I thought I'll go to bed and I'll sleep in. But I was awakened, maybe it was five in the morning. I was awakened two hours later at seven o'clock. And when I woke up, I was so startled because there was like an incredible mantle, a craving, a passion to go to my prayer room next door. I did not know what was wrong. I did not know what was right. I just knew that there was this passion for his presence. And I woke up just in a state of shock. And in my room, there was a form and I won't say everything because what, what only two people know keeps them intimate. But there was a form of a human, like a gray, like a charcoal gray form, like a person. I sleep on the right side of the bed. There's a window out to my backyard to the right, and there's a window and door to the front. And he was between the door to the front, and I had no idea what this meant. My first thought was, Daddy, Daddy has died, because I'd asked the Lord, give me Daddy's mantle for prayer, and I had this thrusting in my spirit to go pray. Except there was no sorrow. So evidently, Daddy had not left. You that have not lost a loved one may not know it, but their invisible presence is so forceful that when they leave, you will feel the world has emptied. It's the most unexplainable thing in the world. You have no idea the invisible presence that saturates an environment until someone you love leaves and the whole world is emptied and you see the world like a shell there's no life in it when someone you love leaves I knew there was joy I knew there was something in my spirit so daddy had not left 
I thought, huh, somebody must be praying for me. I've always told people, every time you see a bag of M&Ms, get on your knees immediately and say, oh, God bless Mike Murdoch. <laughs> then I thought, and it was a thought I was reluctant to nurture. Could, could this be, could, could this be the divine visitation we all dream about? I believe every human wants to have an angelic visitation, some kind of encounter with God that makes doubt impossible. I think we want something to happen to us that forever settles the erratic feelings about a divine persuasion, is there a God? When you see somebody pray for people and one leg is shorter than the other and they said, watch, watch, watch. Inside your mind you think, I think they're pulling that leg forward. I think it's just the way that person's sitting. When someone says I had cancer and it's gone, inside of us is that little thought. I wonder if they really had cancer or if that was a, a wrong diagnosis from a doctor. When someone's sitting in a wheelchair and suddenly somebody says, be healed, and they jump up, we say, I wonder if, if they'd have really tried before. <laughs> if they could have really gotten up. But maybe when the preacher said, be healed, it sort of <laughs> showed to them and there was an emotional reaction in their body. The ability to doubt divine encounters is unexplainable. The greatest battle in your life is the battle of doubt. Continuously, we're searching for affirmation, verification. Tell me again. You build a house for your child, feed them every morning, wash the clothes, wash the dishes, buy the bed, and they say, do you love me? Tell me, I need to hear, do you love me? The capacity for doubt is so demonic, it's so strong, it's so unending. It's the battle of your lifetime. And finally, you just close your eyes and say, well, I just believe, I just believe. And you feel like if I can shut my mind down, my faith will grow. We all subconsciously crave a divine encounter that we cannot doubt, and that's what hit me. Could this be my burning bush experience? I rushed over next door, bounded down the steps beside my swimming pool, went into my little room that's my prayer room, and in a matter of minutes and moments, fell in love with the person of the Holy Spirit. My background should have prepared me because I've certainly been in God's presence my whole life. But the emphasis that I have heard from most people is the prayer language, the prayer tongue, or the word power. Acts 1 8, ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. At eight, I tried to baptize myself in the Holy Spirit. <laughs> I listened to the words from other people's prayer language and tried to copy them so I could pray in tongues. See my tie, 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 see my tie. Or someone said, Kanda, Honda, Saka, Kawasaki, you know, whatever it said. 
trying to speak some words so I would be graduate to have a prayer language. Because I thought people who had a prayer language, like we were a college, and people who didn't have a prayer language was like down here in first grade. I did not know the distinction in a huge way. The power. And then people say, do you feel feel the Holy Spirit? So subconsciously, I thought he must be this invisible gas in the air. There he goes. People say, there was a mist in the top of the building. And that was the Holy Spirit. So subconsciously, I couldn't help but feel like the Holy Spirit must be wind with an eyeball, (laughs) fog with a mouth, power. And I knew it was invisible because when, when someone would fall in the Spirit, we have a phrase, slain in the Spirit, though slain means to be killed. That's the phraseology we've developed. They fell slain. And I saw people fall with nobody pushing them. They said, that's the Holy Spirit. That's the Holy Ghost. Okay. I never tire of the wisdom of God. Wisdom is the ability to recognize difference. Right and wrong. Evil and righteousness. Difference in people. Difference in a countenance. Difference in a moment, like the blind man crying out to Jesus. The dominant purpose for wisdom, and don't you love the wisdom of God? So thankful you're listening today and watching and being a part of the internet, telling others about it. And I hope you're getting, by the way, I hope you're getting my daily podcast every single day on your iPod or your MP3, every single day, two minutes of wisdom. Be a blessing. Sometimes I go a little over because I get excited. I want you to be a part of this ministry. I believe that when you get involved with God, He gets involved with you. I am one of the ministers of the gospel who believe the words of Jesus. I believe every word He said. When he told Peter that there would be a hundredfold return on any investment in the gospel, in Mark 10, 28 through 30, I believed him. When the word of God says in Malachi 3, that if I bring the tithe, which is 10% of my income, and the offering back to him, that he would open the windows of heaven and pour me out a blessing I don't have room enough to receive, I believe him. Why would I believe God about heaven and hell, and not believe him about the blessing of the Lord. I want to pray over the seeds that you have been planting in this ministry. And by the way, I have an incredible gift you're going to love. In fact, it's probably one of the greatest gifts I've ever offered. We're asking the Holy Spirit for 300 partners this week who will set aside a seed of $300 for our outreaches. I need your help. I want you to help me. Not just to feed a thousand children a day, which we do, or a thousand families, or underwrite the wisdom of Asia Bible College, or to underwrite the tent factory in South Africa, or the home of hope, but that we can go into 100 countries with the gospel. I'm holding in my hand the wisdom quick scan Bible. The wisdom quick scan Bible. I have never in my life found a Bible easier to read As you know, for many years, I've read the Bible through 40 chapters a day, every single month of my life. There is no easier book to read than this quick scan Bible. When I found out that I could offer it to you inside of some of the teaching that I've been doing and I'll do today, I want you to have it. Call me right now, plant your seed of 300 and watch God move.
I knew there was joy. I knew there was something in my spirit so daddy had not left. I thought, huh, somebody must be praying for me. I've always told people, every time you see a bag of M&Ms, get on your knees immediately and say, oh, God bless Mike Murdoch. <laughs> then I thought, and it was a thought I was reluctant to nurture. Could, could this be? Could, could this be the divine visitation we all dream about? I believe every human wants to have an angelic visitation, some kind of encounter with God that makes doubt impossible. I think we want something to happen to us that forever settles the erratic feelings about a divine persuasion, is there a God? When you see somebody pray for people and one leg is shorter than the other and they said, watch, watch, watch. Inside your mind you think, I think they're pulling that leg forward. I think it's just the way that person's sitting. When someone says I had cancer and it's gone, Inside of us is that little thought. I wonder if they really had cancer or if that was a, a wrong diagnosis from a doctor. When someone's sitting in a wheelchair and suddenly somebody says, be healed. And they jump up, we say, I wonder if, if they'd have really tried before. <laughs> if they could have really gotten up. But maybe when the preacher said, be healed, it sort of <laughs> showed to them and there was an emotional reaction in their body. The ability to doubt divine encounters is unexplainable. The greatest battle in your life is the battle of doubt. Continuously, we're searching for affirmation, verification. Tell me again. You build a house for your child, feed them every morning, wash the clothes, wash the dishes, buy the bed, and they say, do you love me? Tell me, I need to hear, do you love me? The capacity for doubt is so demonic, it's so strong, it's so unending. It's the battle of your lifetime. And finally, you just close your eyes and say, well, I just believe, I just believe. And you feel like if I can shut my mind down, my faith will grow. We all subconsciously crave a divine encounter that we cannot doubt, and that's what hit me. Could this be my burning bush experience? I rushed over next door, bounded down the steps beside my swimming pool, went into my little room that's my prayer room, and in a matter of minutes and moments, fell in love with the person of the Holy Spirit. My background should have prepared me because I've certainly been in God's presence my whole life. But the emphasis that I have heard from most people is the prayer language, the prayer tongue, or the word power. Acts 1, 8, ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. At eight, I tried to baptize myself in the Holy Spirit. <laughs> I listened to the words from other people's prayer language and tried to copy them so I could pray in tongues. See my tie, 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 see my tie. 
or someone said Kanda Honda Saka Kawasaki, you know, whatever it said. Trying to speak some words so I would be graduate to have a prayer language. Because I thought people who had a prayer language, like we were a college, and people who didn't have a prayer language was like down here in first grade. I did not know the distinction in a huge way. The power. And then people say, do you feel feel the Holy Spirit? So subconsciously, I thought he must be this invisible gas in the air. There he goes. People say, there was a mist in the top of the building. And that was the Holy Spirit. So subconsciously, I couldn't help but feel like the Holy Spirit must be wind with an eyeball, (laughs) fog with a mouth, power. And I knew it was invisible because when, when someone would fall in the Spirit, we have a phrase, slain in the Spirit, though slain means to be killed. That's the phraseology we've developed. They fell slain. And I saw people fall with nobody pushing them. That's the Holy Spirit. That's the Holy Ghost. Okay. And everybody uses a little white bird to represent him. Everybody, everybody, that little dove, except he's not a bird. Tell someone next to you, he's not a bird. Go ahead, they don't know that. They don't know that, almost nobody knows that. Just say, he's not a bird. Say it, he's not a bird. John 14, verse 16. I will pray the Father, he shall give you another comforter, another comforter, another comforter, one like me, that he may abide with you forever. Jesus said, I'm leaving, but I'm sending a replacement to me. And when he comes, he will enable you to do things even greater than I have done. What I've started, he will finish. He will guide you. Watch this. Even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but you know him. You know him. For he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. Verse 26. The comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things. He's a mentor. He's in search of a protege. He talks, he thinks, he plans. He's a strategist. He knows the past, he knows the future. He's keen, he's articulate, he's a master author. He inspired 40 people over a 1600 period, 1600 year period to document the word of God. Bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. Chapter 15, verse 26. When the comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, which proceedeth from the Father, he shall testify of me. Chapter 16, verse 13. Howbeit when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself. Many people think that verse, that section of scripture, means you should not emphasize the Holy Spirit. But Jesus did. Paul did. 
The whole word of God is by the Spirit. And the cry of Jesus in Revelation, hear the voice of the Spirit. Hear what the Spirit says to say to the church. So we know that the Holy Spirit is a talker. He's a conversationalist. He speaks. He speaks. He puts his words in human mouths. And we have that confirmation when we hear a man of God talk. The Holy Spirit is talking to us. The greatest compliment I have ever received in 61 years was sitting in a little recliner and a brother Or Roberts was sitting across from me. He had his pen and legal pad. We were spending Christmas together, their home and the family in California. And he said, Mike, just start talking to me. I said, what do you want me to talk about? He says, anything, just anything. And then he said, when you talk to me, I always know it's something God would say. That's the greatest compliment I can recall in my lifetime. And so I started talking. And his eyes closed and he'd nod and then he'd write down. Then he'd nod and he'd write down. God speaks more than through our conscience. More than through the insects go to the ant, thou sluggard observer ways, how in the summer she prepares for winter. More than a donkey to a rebellious preacher in the Old Testament. He talks more than just through a prophet who is sending a warning to a king who has disobeyed the word of God. He talks more to us than just in our emotions when we feel a sadness because the walls of Jerusalem have been fallen and Nehemiah is called to go and rebuild the walls. God talks more than anybody you've met. He talks continuously. His voice is unending and when you think he's silent, it's because you're not listening and you're not hearing. I think his voice is continuous. I don't think God is ever silent. I think he has put his voice in everything around us. I think he talks more than anyone that you've met can you hear? Can you hear? Can you hear? Can you hear? Are you listening? Can you hear? And Jesus said, I'm sending him to you. Listen to what he says here. It is expedient, verse 7, chapter 16, that for you that I go away, if I go not away, the comfort will not come unto you, but I will depart. I will send him unto you. And when he has come, when he has come, when he has come, you say, wasn't he already here? The Holy Spirit visited the earth in a manifestation. He would come on prophets in the Old Testament. Then he'd leave. He'd take a Saul, and Saul was a little rat, you know. He was just wasn't the best person in the world. But he would get in this environment, and you you preached it. Wouldn't the Holy Spirit come on him? And when the Holy Spirit would come on him, he would prophesy. God, God would visit people. The Holy Spirit would come and he would manifest himself through people. And then you'd see him empty and he wasn't there. And Jesus is saying, he is going to come and stay and abide. And he's not going to leave. And he was doing this to reassure them. You may not see me with these eyes, but he is in you. He shall be with you. He is beside you. And he reminds us that the proof of his joy is his joy. When he has come, he will reprove the world of sin, of righteousness, of judgment. Of sin because they believe not on me. Of righteousness because I go to my Father and you see me no more. Of judgment because the prince of this world is judge. I have many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. How be it? When he, the spirit of truth has come, he will guide you. That word guide is big. He's not just a teacher. He accompanies you. He does not hand you a book and say, find your way. He is not a courier 
with a map. He accompanies you. He is there. When he talks to you, when you hit a crisis, he talks to you. When you hit a situation, he is there. He is not over there. He is not over there. He is in you and he's beside you, accompanying you. I told Marilyn Hickey years ago, I said, Marilyn, I keep seeing his countenance. I keep seeing his countenance. She said, Mike, the word comforter means one who walks along beside you, taking you by the arm where you should go. He shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, whatsoever he shall hear, the Father and the Holy Spirit are conversing, exchanging knowledge, information. He will show you things to come. Acts chapter 13, the book of Acts chapter 13. I know that through questions people ask me that they are not, they're not really in, they're not at all in relationship with the Holy Spirit. Behavior and conduct and questions reveal to me continuously who's not in the spirit. Because he will direct you. Chapter 13, verse 1. There were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers. Verse 2. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. Notice he talks. Notice he knows you by name. Notice he knows your assignment and knows where you belong. He knows exactly the geographical location where your gift will flourish. And when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. So they, being sent forth by the Holy Ghost, departed unto Seleucia, and from thence they sailed to Cyprus. The Holy Spirit is the only person who knows the environment that you have been sent and assigned. Develop, beginning today, a constant sensitivity to the Holy Spirit. Where are you wanting me now? Where should I be? Where should I not be? Minister friends of mine have been killed through ignoring the whispers of the Spirit. A pastor of West Texas, 5,000 people, was killed in an airplane crash. I was upset with God for a year. A year later, I had supper with his widow. She said, the morning of the crash, I think if it was 4.30 or 5.30, she said, he sat on the edge of the bed and said, baby, something tells me I should not fly today. God whispers, he doesn't scream. Yes, he even uses what you call intuition. A pastor and his wife in Mexico was stopped at the gate and the authorities of the airport says, something's wrong with your papers. We can't let you get on this flight. And they battled with them and battled with them and finally they used everything they had and they fought and they got on that plane and it crashed on the coast of California. C.M. Ward stood in line at a ticket counter. And they said, your ticket's no good for this. He said, it's been scheduled. She said, we're overbooked. He said, I've had this scheduled for three weeks. She said, I'm sorry, sir. We won't allow you to get on the plane. If you knew C.M. Ward, he was angered easily. I knew him well, in private as well as public. And he was infuriated. But as he watched the plane, begin to taxi. It exploded in the air and over 200 people were killed. And the Holy spoke, Spirit spoke to him and said, I know mine by name. The Antichrist has a number system. 
with no connection, but we are named. We came from somewhere. We're going to somewhere. Oh, hallelujah. He knows me by name. Say that aloud. He knows me by name. Turn to Acts chapter 8, verse 26. Acts chapter 8, 26. And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise, go toward the south unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. He arose and went. And behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who had the charge of all her treasure, had come to Jerusalem for to worship, was returning, sitting in his chariot, read Isaiah, or Isaiah the prophet. Then the Spirit said unto Philip, Go near and join thyself to this chariot. And Philip ran thither to him. Notice the Holy Spirit knows to whom you are assigned. The Holy Spirit knows who needs you. I hope you can resolve this somehow. Philip ran thither to him and heard him read the prophet Isaiah and said, Understandest thou what thou readest? And he said, How can I? Except some man should guide me. And he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. 34, the eunuch answered Philip, said, I pray thee of whom speaketh the prophet? Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. And as they were on their way, they came unto a certain water. And the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? Philip said, If thou believest with thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stand still. They went down into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized them. When they would come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip, that the eunuch saw him no more. And he went on his way rejoicing, but Philip was found at Azotus. And passing through, he preached in all the cities till he came to Caesarea. I cannot emphasize to you enough the importance of the Holy Spirit in your life. The invisible Jesus who walks on your right side. I fell in love with him that Wednesday morning. And I would trade everything I know for what I found out about the Holy Spirit. He is the one who births conviction and lets you know when you're wrong. He's the one that shows you your gifts. If you read Exodus, would you assist me on the Lord? If you read Exodus, you'll find where the Holy Spirit is the person who gives you your gifts, your ability to sing, your ability to play. All the things that you do, everything that you do, all your gifts, your ability to paint, your ability to pay a piano is from the Holy Spirit. He is the only person you have to obey your whole life. He is the only person capable of being contented with you. He knows what he put in you and he knows what he didn't put in you. He knows your weaknesses and is not turned off by them. The greatest day of my life was July the 13th, 1994. And that was the year and the day that I fell in love with the Holy Spirit. We canceled the conference because of such low interest. Almost nobody in the church registered for it. And when I saw such low interest in knowing the Holy Spirit, I was grieved beyond conversation. But I'll tell you today, on this Lord's day, that you better fall in love with him or you won't survive the things that are coming up on the earth. You better fall in love with him because he's the source of your strength. He's the source of your courage. I wrote and called our guest, special guest and I sent them their honorariums because they had it on their schedule. And I said, I just want to tell you that I regret there was such low interest in knowing the Holy Spirit. 
that I would not destroy that. Somewhere you'll go where there'll be a great hunger to know him. I'll say this today on the Lord's day. He is the source of life. He is the source of life. And you can go to church service after church service. And you can make money hand over fist. And you can build houses and you can have cars. And you can succeed in your wealthy areas. But until you fall in love with him, you will not enjoy his world. You will not enjoy his world. You'll build barns and not enjoy them. You'll build houses and not sleep in them. You'll have nice cars and fuss the whole time you drive them. But if you fall in love with the Holy Spirit, he is the one who sustains you. He's the one that keeps you. He's the one that preserves you. And when nobody believes in you, the one who walks on your right side has not thrown away his plans for your life. I don't need amens and I don't need everything else to get me going through life. Greater is he that's within me than he that is within the world. Don't you, don't you, don't you want to know him? Don't you hunger to know him? I said, don't you hunger to know him? Would you stand with me? Hold your Bible close to your heart and say this aloud, Holy Spirit, forgive me for not pursuing you. Forgive me for not hungering for you. Oh, I have neglected you. Say it aloud, I have neglected you. I am so sorry. Awaken in me a new thirst for you, a new hunger for you. Now in your own words, lift your right hand high and you tell him how you want him to visit your life. Say it aloud, I need a visitation from you. I need a new touch from you. I need a new awakening you. Oh, say it aloud, he needs to hear it from you. I never tire of the wisdom of God. Wisdom is the ability to recognize difference. Right and wrong, evil and righteousness, difference in people, difference in a countenance, difference in a moment, like the blind man crying out to Jesus. The dominant purpose for wisdom, and don't you love the wisdom of God? I'm so thankful you're listening today and watching and being a part of the internet, telling others about it. And I hope you're getting, by the way, I hope you're getting my daily podcast every single day on your iPod or your MP3. Every single day, two minutes of wisdom. Be a blessing. Sometimes I go a little over because I get excited. I want you to be a part of this ministry. I believe that when you get involved with God, he gets involved with you. I am one of the ministers of the gospel who believe the words of Jesus. I believe every word he said. When he told Peter that there would be a hundredfold return on any investment in the gospel, in Mark 10, 28 through 30, I believed him. When the word of God says in Malachi 3, that if I bring the tithe, which is 10% of my income, and the offering back to him, that he would open the windows of heaven and pour me out a blessing I don't have room enough to receive, I believe him. Why would I believe God about heaven and hell and not believe him about the blessing of the Lord? I want to pray over the seeds that you have been planting in this ministry. And by the way, I have an incredible gift you're going to love. In fact, it's probably one of the greatest gifts I've ever offered. We're asking the Holy Spirit for 300 partners this week who will set aside a seed of $300 for our outreaches. I need your help. I want you to help me. Not just to feed a thousand children a day, which we do, or a thousand families, or underwrite the wisdom of Asia Bible College, or to underwrite the tent factory in South Africa, or the home of hope, but that we can go into 100 countries with the gospel. I'm holding in my hand the wisdom quick scan Bible the Wisdom Quick Scan Bible. I have never in my life found a Bible easier to read. As you know, for many years, I've read the Bible through 40 chapters a day, every single month of my life. There is no easier book to read than this Quick Scan Bible. When I found out that I could offer it to you inside of some of the teaching that I've been doing and I'll do today, I want you to have it. 
Call me right now, plant your seed of 300 and watch God move.